Well, thank you for staying with us. We're talking corruption now, and it's not about perception. It's about the reality. Over 15,000 people in that latest survey by Shraj, the Ghana Statistical Service, and the UNODC. So what are the revelations? Let's start with this report that uh, we put together. Bernice, would you like to give us some of the details? Yes, I will. So um, we start on the note of prevalence of bribery total and by level of urbanization. So 83.8% of the adult population had at least one contact with a public official. Okay, And so that's 80.5% uh, rural areas, 86.1% urban areas. So this is interesting. Prevalence of bribery, and it's color-coded, okay? So when you see uh, the really uh, dark um, mustard, 30 to 55. Uh, which, which means there's a, a, a higher prevalence rate there. Exactly. In fact, the highest according to this chart. Exactly. And then uh, the one after that is 28 to 30. Then you have 90 to 28. And the very light one, 10 to 19. And that's within the Bono East and Savannah regions. Mm. So let's focus on the, uh, the regions with the highest prevalence. Northeast, Bono Ahafo, Ahafo, Western North, Western and Greater Accra. I would have been no, surprised. No, no, no surprises about, about the Greater Accra region. Yes, I would have been really surprised. Especially because of the North. concentration of a lot of our, you know, public institutions. Definitely. So, uh, so let's move on to the next one. The others, Eastin Ashanti, well, they, they're in the middle there. So this but, but, is... But, but, but there's a bit of a surprise. If we could yeah. go back to the previous slide, just mm -hmm. briefly. The Ashanti region... Mm -hmm. Uh, is is uh, I think that is twenty eight to thirty. Well, it's still high, mm -hmm. but I thought it would be yeah, much closer to. It's not twenty eight to thirty. It's actually nineteen to twenty. Uh, that's what I'm reflecting on. Whether it's nineteen to twenty eight or twenty eight to thirty. But I found that interesting because of, uh, you know, they are the next yeah. biggest, biggest in terms region, of. Yeah. Terms of well, the the, the 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 city Kumasi is yeah. our next biggest city, yeah. or, and then in terms of administration and all of that. So I found that to be surprising, which which is quite a positive for the Ashanti region. Yes, it is. Mm. On to the next one now. So the other interesting point has to do with the the age group. age grouping. Yes. So age twenty five to thirty four are the age group most likely to pay in bribes. Are you surprised? To 34, I'm not surprised. This is the active group. A lot of people in this age group would be looking for, for jobs, jobs <laughs> would be trying to get around the system to get mm. maybe a Ghana card or yes. something. Yes. Like People around this age group are active, mm -hmm. and I'm not surprised they are the ones yeah. paying, yeah, you yeah, know, most likely to pay bribes. I think in a, a, a like, or so maybe even get into an institution. Mm -hmm. So the lowest figure has to do with 65 plus. By then you're on retirement, mm. you know, you're sitting at home cooling off. The engagement between such people and public officials is very minimized, so it's not surprising at all. And then you have uh, the 18s to 24, 23 to 9 percent, 35 to 49, 28.9 percent, and 50 to 64, 24.2 percent. Okay. People with the, this is what it gets really interesting, Benjamin. People with the highest level of education <laughs> are 1.7 times more likely to pay bribes than people with no formal education. It also comes down to interaction, okay? Yeah. So you're talking about people who are interacting with the Lands Commission, who are interacting with the... Uh, police were interacting with public servants. With the GRA. The, you the, know, so you'd, you'd, you'd usually expect that such persons are educated. And uh, so uh, the figures are interesting there, but it gives you, it breaks it down further, uh, where 23.3%, uh, no formal education, you know, in terms of percentage of people likely to pay a bribe. Primary education, 24.2%. Secondary education, 27.4%. Post-secondary, non-tertiary education, 27.4%. And tertiary education, 4.6%. And we've explained why uh, this possibly reflects this way. Hmm. 
Now, it's interesting, right? We're looking at the average number of bribes paid in 2021. And it's, it's, it's startling. More than 17.4 million bribes were paid in uh, 2021. And of course, the urban areas 4.8 with the rural areas paying 5.4. What I found interesting here was the bit about the fact that in the rural areas, there's even more in terms of uh, the, the quantum than in the urban areas. But if you also consider that we have more rural areas than urban centers, then it also makes sense. because of, So it means that actually the urban areas, though not that concentrated, but because you, you have a concentration of industry and all of that and MMDAs and all, but they've still come close to the urban areas, which are uh, many more in terms of the re re representativeness, if you like. All right. So there's, a, there's an interesting... Let's go back. Yeah. So of those people who reported that they had paid a bribe in 2021, 29.3% reported having done so only once, whereas 17.6% reported paying more than 10 bribes in the 12 months prior to the survey. And Benjamin, you know, we've had this conversation before here where we said that it is increasingly becoming difficult for people who, who want to do the right thing to survive in this country. It's interesting. I was having a discussion with, with our sound engineer, and he made mention of the fact that, look, now if you do the right thing, you are the odd one. You are, you are the odd one. Mm. You are the one who stands out for the wrong reasons because you're doing, you know, the usual talk among even boys' boys. We are John, you know. Mm -hmm. Oh, you didn't do that. You didn't take advantage of the situation. And uh, it, 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 it doesn't work for us. Okay. So it thankfully, we, we have two guests to help us digest this particular uh, latest report we are discussing here. Martin Pebu is a lawyer and Edem Sinanu is an anti-graft campaigner. Let's start with Mr. Pebu. Uh, thank you so much for joining the conversation, lawyer. And great to have you here. So, I mean, this time, Benjamin mentioned earlier in the show, this goes beyond perception to real experiences. People telling us, the kind of, um, the number of times they've paid bribes, the, the amounts they've had to give. Interesting dynamics you're picking up. Uh, so, for example, you see the greater Accra region and other regions, the, you know, on the, on the, on the, uh, on the map, uh, having high numbers when it comes to payment of bribe. I don't know if you've seen this particular report, but what's your initial reading of, of, of it. Yeah, so Benis, good morning. Yeah, I've seen the report as far as I can read. I'm rushing into court, so obviously I didn't finish <laughs> reading the over 100 pages. Mm -hmm. But what I uh, get out of what I've read is that, look, it, it's just further confirmation, okay, that corruption is really such a huge problem, and that's putting it very mildly. A natural fact, I belong to the school of thought that it is our biggest problem as a nation. Even before this, you know, the Auditor General's report says that between 2016 and 2020, we lost 48 billion to corruption. Then it's 48 billion. If we were to convert 48 billion to the old currency, we'll be getting into a trillions of Ghana cities. So. So for those who are used to the old currency, so over a trillion, 48 billion, if you convert it to the old, you get a trillion, okay? So the point is that this report just adds on. People who say corruption is a perception, no, 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 don't live in Ghana. It's always been a problem from Kwame Nkrumah's day to today, except that it's such a shame that we are not able to fight it. Mm. That's putting it mildly. But, but why aren't we able to fight it? Because we have weak leaders. That's the main problem. I, I think, you see, it's true that we have cultural issues with corruption, mm -hmm. okay? Yes, mm -hmm. it's, it's embedded in our, in our uh, culture. People mm -hmm. tell you, when you go to the chief's palace, don't go empty-handed mm -hmm. and all that. They say that is what has fed into what we are suffering. But with hindsight, I believe it's leadership. Leadership, leadership, leadership. They say a fish rots from its head. So where the head itself is rotting, and so I'm quickly coming to the point that 
Hi, yesterday, look, I heard lay people on radio make a certain point, and I buy into it. They said the capital of corruption is the Jubilee House. So this report should be thrown into the dustbin. The capital of corruption is the Jubilee House. That's where real corruption, the big, you know, the millions of dollars, that's where it happens. That is where all the big people are, and that is where they do the biggest deal. So we are talking about petty corruption, not to undermine it, but it's just that uh, the police, the 10 cities here, 20 cities here, integration and the rest, it's a joke. The millions of dollars is at Jubilee House. Ah, Bernice, I'm sure you know this uh, story that we've been following for the past one month. Northern Development Authority. Yes. Dr. Namzoya finds that they, uh, they are about to, that's his, the current uh, CEO and his people are allowing about 5.2 million to be uh, listen, paid, contrary to signed contracts. He blows a whistle in January of this year, and we are in July. The presidency hasn't taken any step. The president doesn't want to know about it. He doesn't care. The chief of staff, to whom the letter was addressed, equally doesn't care. Uh, uh, Napaga Tia Suleimana, who is the coordinator of the uh, special initiatives, she was copied in the letter. She doesn't care. The chief director at Jubilee House also signed the 5.2 million uh, requisition for 5.2 million to be paid, contrary to their contract. They all don't care. So you see that... Uh, that, that, that doesn't warrant, though, uh, Mr. Kwebu, doesn't warrant what you're saying, this whole scale... Uh, you know, indictment of the executive because you say you, you buy into that rhetoric that the Jubilee House is the seat or house of corruption. That, do these, you know, justify making that point? Because we've also seen initiatives combating uh, corruption. So can you, can oh, you, can you make such a blanket statement? Oh, that's, uh, what do you call it? That is lip service. The initiatives are lip service, just to you know, uh, you know, uh, divert attention. Let's come back. Look, uh, Mr. Akapu, the big big contracts to get a big contract, multi million dollar contract, Mr. Akapu, it doesn't work in Ghana. You can't just sit in your office, go and bid and get a multi million dollar contract. Who born dog? Who tells you that's how contracts are done? You need to lobby. Sometimes you lobby up to the presidency, and I'm saying so on authority. Mr. Akaku, I am saying so on authority. Within the big, big contracts, $100 million contract, even $50 million, some even as low as $5 million, $10 million. You need to go lobby there. That is the citadel of corruption, please. Right? There's no argument about that. Anybody who wants, as I told you, I'm going to court. We can have a full debate. Maybe you can prepare, say that, okay, in two weeks, let's have a debate on corruption. Let's gather all the evidence and come. Hey, Mr. Kaku, have you forgotten the Ameri deal? Ejaku uh, was going to sign the, this and he advised the president to pay 850 million. We're going to sign a contract for 850 million dollars. When thankfully somebody leaked it, what did the president say? Because they were caught pants down. Then he said, oh, they were uh, mis uh, this is ill advice. He was wrongly advised. Well, is that not really house? I'm not being for the whistleblower. $850 million, that's how much we're going to pay. Didn't it take a whistleblower to bring it out? Okay. And then you have uh, the Auditor General, Dom Levo, where he came, his first major achievement, public servants, and there were people also from Jubilee House involved, were going to steal $1 billion dollars. Even the president himself acknowledged it. Public servants, some of them are Jubilee House involved. We're going to steal one billion dollars. It took the Mlevo to intervene and he caught them. So we can go on and on and on. There are other examples. Mm -hmm. And I've told you currently six months, we have shown the president evidence that look, people are about to take about five million dollars illegally out of the public purse. The president said, oh, please, I will have nothing to do with it. I don't care about your public purse. Hmm. So, Mr. Akako, we are justified, please. Mm, lawyer, so we have a big situation on our hands. I remember about a year or two ago, the NCCE started an initiative to go into schools to try and build values in the younger generation so that at least if, 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 if the older generation 
um, don't want to really solve the problem by instilling setting values in the younger generation we can correct the wrongs um, just a week ago we know that um, there was a paper cancelled in the school of law due to leakage um, people go to take exams in the medical school there's leakage it appears that we are a valueless society and we are driving ourselves into a ditch who then can help us? How can we save ourselves? The leaders aren't helping. The people themselves do not have any values to, to help us get out of this mess. It appears we're just, you're just going with the wind. Yes, I like that. The last one, just going with the wind. But Bernice, the saving grace is that, like you guys are doing now, I see there's a new resolve by our society to fight this canker, just like you're doing now. You see that I'm sure if we check within the last one month, this topic would have uh, this has been discussed before. All right, meaning within the last one month, you did something like that, and today it's back on the front banner, front and center, right? So I am optimistic that the way young people are interested in fighting this, you see, Adam Senan is coming, and sometimes when I listen to Adam, I'm like, God, when is when are we going to give people like Adam the opportunity? Opportunity to control the affairs of this country because I listen to Adam and I'm like, oh, this man. Eh. Because you see, sometimes yes, yeah, somebody will tell you that talk is cheap, but other times you listen to some people and you're like, no, this one will do it. So young people need to come together. Let's form more fan clubs, anti-corruption, like Adam is done, and so on and so forth. Then let's begin to give more time to this. Like I've told uh, the story about the NBA, how the president is going to sleep chief of staff to whom even the letter was expressly addressed, she's gone to sleep then. Fremo or Seo Pari, how can she do that? And she's still in office. Where we expect that she should have gone by now, she should have resigned, the president should have resigned, Baumia too should have resigned, and they are in office. So I think that let's gather more young people to join in the fight. Because listen, if we were to keep quiet, it will get worse. Mm. If we were to keep quiet, it will get worse. But, but, but lawyer, hasn't, hasn't that been our story? Sorry to interject. I mean, I, I have been doing this job sitting here for at least four to five years. And we've been talking about this, not to, not to demean the efforts that you and other persons have put in in dealing with a, the fight against corruption. We've been talking a lot about this. But it appears to be getting worse by the day. And, th and that's why I'm saying... What can save us? What, what can we do? We read about other countries where there are really drastic penalties for persons caught in corruption, like being killed, you know. I mean, that's extreme. But you ask yourself, yeah. at this point of, of, of the life of this country, what can save us? We've tried talking. We've tried education. We even have laws. But we are still here. Yes, uh, Benny, yes, but we have to continue talking. Everything co uh, starts with a conversation. Then we get into action. So like I said, let the young people, like you've done. So maybe, you know the last time, Captain Smart led a demonstration on anti-corruption, right? Okay, so this is 2022. Let's do one. Let's organize one in the ne uh, next month. Uh -huh. And good, uh, you know, about two weeks ago, the CSOs came together. CDD, Imani, Occupy Ghana, myself, Samson Ladi Ayenedi, Lawyer Akutwampa, Professor Kakari, and so on and so forth. So the CSOs have come together to fight this problem, corruption, and other ones. So maybe you guys should join in. Radio, I, I think maybe Joy FM, are you already part? Well, uh, it appears so. So we will be rolling out more programs. We'll be rolling out more because, Bernice, like you said, other places, people were killed. In Ghana, we also killed, yet corruption hasn't disappeared. So killing is no longer a solution. Okay, you remember when T.J. King uh, let the blood flow? Didn't uh, he kill uh, for, uh, how many, three former uh, head, heads of state and all that? Okay, so we've tried the killing and it didn't solve it, though it brought it down. So I'm all for us continuing the fight. And then it's good. I wanted to even reach out to Raymond Akpa, since uh, we are doing this. Let me bring this in now. Benis, I think it will help our society a lot. If you guys will do a documentary on the people 
who have been convicted so far for corruption and causing financial loss, especially, you know, the first, uh, during the Rollins regime, when he was living, when Kufo came into office, you know, Minister of Finance, Kwame Pepra, Minister of Agric, Ibrahim Madam, Payanki, and, and another person, right? They were convicted recently, remember Abu Gabili, uh, mm. and so on and so forth. You see what uh, Adamu Sakande did. Maybe we'll just that's widen it to politicians who have done ill and were, uh, listen, jailed, convicted for their crimes. Mm. Let's do a documentary on that. And then you play it from time to time. Because trust me, Benny, you'll be surprised that perhaps what I just stated today, that would be the first time that some uh, millennials would have heard about mm. it. Because maybe at, at the time, Ibrahim and Beko were convicted. Certainly, they were too young. So they don't know. So let's do a documentary on all these convictions. Let's do it. Let's mm. do it. Because mm. it also helps in the uh, education. Mm. And then let, let's just continue the fight. Mm. So uh, finally, from me, uh, lawyer, on this, there are those who say that you can't win the fight against corruption until you have a holistic approach to total well-being. So some, some justify the action by police officers to say, look, their salary is very meager, okay? So um, some of them use it as an opportunity to support their, their very meager salaries. There are those who suggest that, look, there, there are no jobs, so people must pay their way into the very little space that we have. How do you think we should tackle these contributors to corruption so that we don't focus on the branches of the problem and leave the root cause. Okay. Yes, so the, uh, from what you said, it's holistic. I think actually we are currently doing the holistic approach because as you and I are talking right now, so there are even more, uh, what do you call it, public officers in court now being prosecuted. Oh, we even forgot. Do you remember about... Um, a year, a year and a half ago, the NCA matter, that's the uh, Tetevi, Alajil Dimuna, and Co. were also convicted, the mm. NCA, causing mm. financial loss, the NCA case, right? So, let the prosecutions mm. continue. Right now, you are, and I are involved in educating the public, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. And that's another part. Then you look at issues of uh, um, ghost names. Certain initiatives have been rolled out. So, we are doing it, but... Mm. It appears we don't, is the education that's rather not be enough. What about looking at, perhaps we should. Sorry, lawyer, what about looking sorry? at, what about looking at what people earn as monthly income? What about looking at tackling the issue of job availability? So you don't have a situation where people have to pay their way into job job uh, uh, office or people have to justify what the police do by saying but they, you don't even pay them a lot and there's so much happening in the country and they need to sort themselves out so if they catch somebody doing the wrong thing they'll just say look the, the legal system is even stressful give me something and let me let you go okay great let's do the police and arrest i think we should stop uh this thing that they are not well paid and it's Nobody is well paid in Ghana. So it's not an excuse. Because if we were to say that everybody should be paid what he, he really deserves, then there would be no money to pay anybody. So please, the police, if you mentioned I mean mention the police as an example, at least they are earning a living. Dennis, you know the number of graduates, people who want to work and they are not getting work. So we are coming to the second leg, which is unemployment. So if you look at the millions who are ready to work for the pay that some people are saying is not sufficient, please, we can't continue saying that people have not been uh, well paid. So it's a reason for them to do uh, uh, this involved in corruption. And let me quickly mention this. I heard when this report came out, I had some radio stations making the same point, and they are referring to just public officers' salaries. They don't know the allowances. They don't know the allowances that add up. So please, before anybody comes to say the public officer is not well paid, be sure you know, apart from his salary, all the allowances. And I want to repeat with all the energy I can master, all the allowances, be sure you know that before you come and sit and just mention the person's basic pay and say that, oh, then that means that it's not well paid. And so let me be specific. Somebody mentioned that in the military, the highest person is paid 4,000 something. Let's say it's not more than 5,000. And he was talking about only basic. He hasn't talked about allowances. So please, let's stop 
uh, this is misleading citizens. Yes, we all accept. Me too, as a lawyer who says I'm well paid. But we are all managing. We are all managing. So that's not an excuse. Let's come to the second one. Yes, unemployment is such a huge problem. You know, because of that. So yesterday, when I uh, joined Arise Ghana, at the public forum, I, I called on the president to resign. Yeah, Baumia because the production, we're going to produce so much that we don't need to tax. They came in and they are taxing and taxing and even taxing uh, this, uh, money in our packets, e-levy. I see a TC council come there. I see a TC council come there. Mr. Right? Kwebu. The money in our packets already. Money we've already paid uh, taxes on. It's what is being double taxed. So, all right, so I need to enter. All right. right. I'm grateful Definitely. for your Thank time. You. Thank you so much for making time to join us. That was Martin Pebu there. And right. that rather uh -huh. <laughs> interesting note. I see they said, they said, uh, yeah, 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 but they meant to tax the money in, in our, our pockets. pockets. Yeah. The one already. Very, 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 okay. Very, let, very let's, interesting. Let's, let's bring in Adam Senanu, an anti graphs campaigner. Adam, uh, you've been very patient. We had to uh, do this to allow uh, lawyer Pebu to also get to court, uh, but thank you for being so patient with us. It's interesting, on the back of our engagement yesterday for that IMF program and why we keep ending up you know, going for that facility, for example, the bit about corruption. Now, what is your general overview of uh, this latest report? Considering that in 2014, we came up with our National Anti-Corruption Action Plan. It appears the action is not actioning. Um, I think to put into context, the five billion figure, uh, it hits me. I mean, it's, it's part of the fact that this is nothing new. We know there is uh, corruption going on. Uh, I, so I, I mean, that, 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 is, that is more than what we are hoping to get from the E-Levy. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. It hits you. I mean, as a research work done with the Ghana Statistical Service, where we talk about actuals, um, We've always said that, look, perception-based indexes give you a very strong indication based on, on the methodology of what is going on. But now we have the facts, and the facts say that as much as 5 billion. It tells you that this is widespread. It tells you that we need to look at ourselves more seriously as a, as a nation, and uh, we probably shouldn't be using and focusing on one or two key ways of addressing this, but much more holistic in thinking through how do we nab this? And I think that we probably need to go a little more below the surface. Um, why are Ghanaians not reporting? What can we do to make sure that there's protection for whistleblowers and, and, and you know, witness protection is more effective? What can we do to eat, speed up prosecution so that this is truly high risk, you know, low gain? Because at the moment it's low risk, high gain. Um, and I think that we have the brains to think a little more creatively to get solutions that work. Um, I heard Bernice, I could hear her, her cry, so to speak, that look, doesn't look like anything is changing. It's been four years sitting at this. I think it's also good to put it into context. If you look at the countries that have made progress in terms of democracy, they had about 200 years of building that, uh, I don't want to call it animal, but that system for it to work for them. And perhaps we need to juxtapose where we are now as a country with other countries and what they went through to get to the point where they have systems that work. We say that the prize of a thriving democracy is eternal vigilance by the citizens. By that, there must always be a continuous demand. And so those of us who are here and understand what is going wrong need to hold hands. We need not to despair. We continue to think and see what we can do much more concretely to get the results that this nation needs. And those will be my preliminary remarks. I want to avert your attention to page 12. I know you've taken some uh, look at the report. It's a pretty lengthy report. It will take time to digest, over 100 pages. But I'll pick and choose between the pages for relevant content. When you look at page 12, contact rate by educational attainment. I'll link that to the actuals of those who make payments at 2021. So this just reflects the, the contact rate referring to the number of adult Ghanaians who had at least one contact 
with a public official. No formal education stands at 79.8%. And you would think that is high, but guess what? Primary education, 84.2%. Secondary education, 84.3%. Post-secondary non-tertiary education, 89.6%, and then tertiary education, 91.6%. It gets higher as they climb the, you know, the, the educational plane. And that is also reflected when you go to this other slide, and, and that one is the next one. That is page 16 of the report. That one reflects, again, you would see a gradual incremental value. 23.3% for those with no formal education, 24.2% uh, for those with primary education, 274 secondary, uh, post-secondary, 274 and tertiary, 406 You know what this tells me? The better educated our people are getting, we're basically breeding educated criminals in, in the country. And how does that reflect Edem Sinanu? I'm giving you my final bit here. Because again, when you look at the average bribe, bribe sizes, and you look at our institutions, you would see that where we are putting the most educated people is where corruption is happening the most. On top, in terms of figures they give out, Lands Commission, Next, our judges and magistrates and prosecutors. Next, the Ghana Immigration Service. Next, the elected local government representatives. Follow that with MMDAs, and the list goes on and on. The educated class has this country in a chokehold in terms of corruption. How do you figure? Well, I mean, it's a fair description based on the facts that have been thrown out by the report. I think that what you are seeing is an educated group who think that there is no other option but to follow the trend. And so it's like, this is the norm. Um, the question is, are there options that they could have explored or exploited um, and that we could then say, therefore we should not be seeing this trend. And that is why I'm saying, I think we need to think some more about where we find ourselves and what we can do differently. Um, so, yes, the trend shows that as you go up the educational uh, ladder, one appears to be paying more. It probably also is simply to say, not necessarily because, because sometimes you need to do an analysis of the factors contributing to this. It could also simply be the fact that um, at the lower level, what they need to engage with public services and similar services for are much less than as you go up the ladder. So the contributory factors to the interpretation would be such that one cannot say that it simply is because they have more education. It could simply be because those who climb the ladder have more need of services that are within the public domain and therefore, the level of engagement therefore increases as you know, grab the ladder. Those with less formal education probably are not looking at needs that have services as well, of a public nature. Having said that, I think it is also important that we therefore target those people. It, the data provides opportunity. It means, look, we can identify the constituency that is engaged most in this. How do we help them to rethink what is going on? How do we make it more high risk, less, less gain, more, less gain? How do we provide systems where they know that, look, I can still get the result without having to make this payment? And I think that's the fundamental issue. People want to get results and they want to get it timely. If they think that the system will not deliver those results without making this payment and they're in a hurry, they are bound to begin to engage in things that uh, ordinarily, they wouldn't do if the systems work. So how do we get our systems to work? How do we get people their results? We probably, as a society, need to think some more about that. And leadership is key. So if we can identify that uh, it's people going to the police for, or going to the DVLA, or going, what is the service that people need? What are the payments they're having to make for what services? How do we reduce the human factor and increase 
the interface where this can be done without mm. money having to, you know, exchange to hands. think more critically. I mean, the jurisdictions where this is being managed and minimized, they have done the thinking and they've put in their systems. And, and we just have to copy and, ad and adapt uh, to our situation. I would ask uh, for your, your concluding thoughts on what you, you think that, I mean, beyond what you said, what do you think we could do? But I found this of interest. I think it's page 27 of the report. It, it, it feeds into what we've already discussed. So look, when it comes to the contact rate by type of public officials in 2021, at the bottom, you have the National Intelligence Bureau, formerly the BNI. I'm not surprised. I mean, uh, if, if you go on that trajectory and you get caught, it could mean something else. Then the embassy and consulate officers, 0.5%. Interestingly, prison officials, 0.7%. They are from the bottom in that order. But then look at the top. In terms of contact rate, you know how our system is, no bed syndrome. Or maybe you need a pint of blood, you can't get it. Uh, you, you want to get into some academic institution or maybe something else related. You want your grades taken care of. And then utilities, people are cutting corners. But look at them. Doctors, nurses, and midwives, in terms of contact rate, 60.2%. Teachers, lecturers, or professors, 51.3%. Public utility officials, think ECG, think Ghana Water Company, think of the other utility pr providers, 43 0.2%. Uh, uh, I found this rather interesting. Maybe your quick reflections on that as you sum up as well uh, with the way forward. But I think it is useful to note that even though the contact rate by type of public officer, you have doctors, nurses, and midwives at the top, teachers, you know, uh, and yet, in the corruption rating, I think the police were at the top. Yes, they, in yeah, fact, right. the, the, the prevalence, when it comes to the real prevalence, uh, which yeah. is page 28, the real prevalence, police officers are on top with 53.2%, followed by immigration service officers, 37.4%, GRA customs officers, 33.6%. So year in, year out, we are talking about, oh, we are not meeting our revenue targets, though in recent years we've overshot them. But no surprise then why we are not meeting them, because some people there are cutting corners. Yeah, so I think that the data provides us enough information. First of all, it tells you that uh, in spite of the greater contact that doctors, nurses, midwives have with people, they are not the ones demanding as much money. There's some credit there. On the other hand, it tells you that those who have less contact at 14.9 are demanding more. I think that it allows us for, look, if you had enough investigators, you had a fast track court, you have systems in place, you start at the top of those who are engaged as far as this report is concerned in compelling people to pay bribes, et cetera, and go on a campaign. I mean, that is what leadership is about. So if, if government wanted to give a robust response to, for, to this, use this data to inform where do we suddenly crack the whip, put in place systems, grab people, sanction them, demonstrate that we're going to do this sector by sector. We're going to use this report. We can even do it simultaneously across sectors. Let's have some robust responses. That is what leadership is about. Leadership is cost. Everything else is effect. If we have good leadership, we can minimize the impact of corruption on the public best and get much more development for it. And if we look at the issue of, uh, Benis raised this and I thought it's substantive. Look, we have about 30% of the working population being taxed to take care of the needs of this nation. Right. Domestic revenue mobilization must be expanded. The tax net must be expanded. What it will do is you have much more money. You reduce the tax levels on individuals that have more disposable income Mm. And we'll have a situation where many more people can take care of themselves and families and not be so inclined um, to be bribed or paying bribes, etc. So it's still leadership. All the right. issues we look at, we need to demand much more from our government. And I like the way Martin went about it. No bars held back. <laughs> Just shut at it. We are calling on our presidency. Look, the solutions are there. If we are listening, I think that there are things we can do even now so that we can get some results. Thank you so much, Adam, uh, for joining the conversation. And keep it up, the drive uh, against graft in our society. We're grateful for your time. Thank you for having me. So we're joined by Martin Pibwa, lawyer, and Adam Senanu, an anti-graft campaigner.
on uh, that. But stay with us. Tomorrow is D-Day as we start with the first clinic of the Ecobank Joy News Habitat Fair. Of course, Joy News in partnership with Ecobank, the Pan-African Bank and the Plan Cities Extension Project from Cities and Habitats will make home ownership easy peasy. This year's fair is under the theme Home Ownership, Where You Live Matters. At the Ecobank Joy News Habitat Fair, We've got you covered with all your needs from mortgages, personal loans, consumer financing, land acquisition, security, and many more. So join us at the Achimota Retail Center for the first clinic from tomorrow, the 22nd of July, to Sunday, the 24th of July, from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. daily. There will be exciting ex you know, activities, including webinars, giveaways, and many more. For inquiries, please call us on 054-690-8179 or 54 Zero one one zero three eight nine. The Ecobank Joy News Habitat Fair is in partnership with Ecobank, the Pan African Bank, and powered by the Plan City Extension Project from Cities and Habitats Rent to Own. It's also sponsored by Elegant Homes and General Construction Limited, where quality meets value. Virtual Security Africa, Complete Security so uh, Solutions. Superlock Technologies Limited, you deserve the best. DBS Industries Limited, we truly are your roof experts. Duraplast Limited, where Duraplast goes, water flows. And Gold Key Properties, building prestige since 1997. Ecobank Joy News Habitat Fair, where you live matters. And we'll be talking about that up next on the show.